when, when it comes to racial identity politics in the context of Ireland, the problem is is that like, people of colour have only really existed in Ireland for the last 100 years. Welcome to episode two of season two of Gurm TV. My name is Momoa Ogoro and I have my wonderful panelists here for a web show that dissects the social issues that affect Ireland's multicultural generation. So in this episode, we're going to be talking about identity politics and identity politics in Ireland. I know in the past year or two, there's been an like explosion of social consciousness that we discussed in season one, but I kind of wanted to discuss further in the terms of identity, how it manifests and how it's, um, how it's related to identity politics as well. I understand that um, a, lot of, a lot of people have been having debates and discussions online and, online, and I kind of wanted to unpack it further with my wonderful panelists here. So just to bring it to the floor, does anyone have, I know, I know, um, have a definition of, of identity politics and then we can get the conversation going from there. So Tabby? Um, so we are seeing identity politics and we are defining it as a tendency for people of a particular religion, race, social background to form ex exclusive political alliances and moving away from traditional board-based party politics. Thank you. Thanks for that definition. So with that, I kind of wanted to ask, because we have that political affiliation based on your identity markers and things like that. So I wanted to ask, like, what are the positives and what are the negatives to that? And how, how does that relate and mingle with each other? Does anyone have anything to say? Tiziana? It's actually good because um, there is only so much you can do as an individual. But if you come together with, with other people and you're all coming from you know the same perspective you can be more powerful in terms of you know lobbying uh, politicians or uh, multinationals or you know governments um, and so i think it's a question of trying to you know um, get together with people who have the same uh, point of view and so that's a good thing, but on the other end, uh, it can be a bad thing. For example, if you are, um, um, you know, if you if you want to genuinely listen to concerns of people from a certain group, and they 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 don't want you to be part of it because they you know maybe they feel uncomfortable or they feel you may not understand. Uh, so I guess there are, you know, good things and, and bad things. Hmm. Sandrine. Uh, yeah, no, I just wanted to touch on uh, Tiziana's point in regards to like um, surrounding yourself with people who kind of have the same identity politics. And like I kind of take it from the perspective of like BLM, but then like within the Irish context itself. So like, do you know, like last year was kind of like the first time that everyone in Ireland was kind of talking about racism and that BLM element of it, it did kind of bring this connective element like where I don't know, like with another black person in Galway, I, I connected with them because of that shared experience, those shared elements of what BLM stood for. But I think on the flip side of that and the negative aspect of it, it was very like, we took that from an American sense where it's very narrow minded when it came to Ireland, like where it's still thought that BLM just meant it was only, we're only dissecting racism in regards to that happens to black people. But then within the Irish context, it wasn't that like BLM stood for all the different forms of racism that have already been always in Ireland. And we just never talked about it. So like we literally saw, like, especially with anti-traveler, like they literally, like I saw Twitter trends about that, where like people just refused to bring them into that conversation of Black Lives Matter. And I saw there was like a celebrity, a traveler celebrity, I think Huey something. He was in, I think, Big Brother or something like that. And he literally posted about it. And he was like, I can never see a Black Lives Matter for travelers. Do you know? So where like I saw that where I was like, and I saw it and I was like, surely not. But then I was like, it is because even here, like people like different events I've been attending, people still think that like BLM is just for black people. And it's very now, like in an American context, yes, because they have the like the political movement of BLM, the way it's calling for recognition of different things that is in regards to the dehumanization of black bodies in that setting. But here in Ireland, it's such 
a new phenomenon in regards to addressing all the different forms of racism. So that's like the narrow minded view I can see when it does come to identity politics with movements like such as that, where we really need to depart away from the status quo of that, like the traditional element of BLM and just try to understand how racism really um, works differently in Ireland and how, again, like you can literally have like with, I don't know, like with the, again, like with the travelers, but then Asian community, anything like that, like they all have to be included when we say Black Lives Matter, where it just can't be something that is just exclusively just to Black people. And I think like refusing to see them, refusing to see those intersectionality element of it is mm -hmm. harmful because you're not seeing it as a whole. Definitely, definitely. I, and I can see your point there, but I've, I've spoken to people, uh, people in Ireland as well, that like when they think of that, Black Lives Matter movement as like a whole that is coming from that kind of gives voice to people who um, receive discrimination they think think of it like okay they're just lumping all of the people together and I like your point where you touched on the the black life, like having Black Lives Matter movements for travelers and how that kind of exists but there's, there's this kind of idea that having Black Lives Matter movement for everyone that receives racism or on, on the receiving end of racism is kind of lumping them together. But I just want to kind of touch on that as well. I know um, Eric wanted to jump in. Yeah, just wanted to draw on what everyone has said thus far and agree that in saying that I think identity politics can, as history has proven, undoubtedly be, be used as a tool for social justice. Um, you know, if one particular group, identitarian group in society is facing barriers or obstacles or issues, we'll take the example of black people in America, since we were speaking of BLM in America, you know, the laws that were passed, the civil rights act and le legislation that were passed were inherently identity political because they were passed to equalize society for people that face disadvantages because of their identity. So I think it can kickstart very useful conversations as to the barriers and issues faced because of identity. And as Sisiana drew on, you know, many communities throughout the world have bodies, organizations, and uh, kind of political groups that they establish to represent their communities, to lobby the government, to introduce things that are good for their communities. So identity politics, I think, is inherent and it's apparent within our society. But to speak to the title, of this discussion, I definitely think there is um, there are occasions where it can outstretch itself and go too far, and because all in all, uh, you know. You, although identity politics allows us to address issues faced by some people because of their identity, I think a unified approach in tackling issues is inherently better. Uh, as Sandrine said, racism, discrimination is not only a, a, an issue that affects one particular community, it affects a lot of other people. So we need to fight issues that one community faces when it comes to discrimination, for example, but allow our efforts to bleed into other communities and bleed into efforts to fight the issues that they face because of their identity. So I think opening up our perspective is very important when it comes to identity politics. To speak to Ireland and our predicament, I, I think it's very important to acknowledge the fact that in America, I think identity is such an extroverted, highlighted, emphasized topic in America. It, it, in so many different discussions and conversations, identity is apparent in the political makeup of, of that country. So here in Ireland, whilst there's you know, still a movement of emigration that is dwindling down, but it's, it's still present. Whilst there's more minority groups speaking up about their rights and about things they want to fix within the country for their community, we need to ensure that we pioneer the discussion that uses the right type of identity politics that unites us and appeals to our common humanity and sees one issue as not just an issue of one community or another community, but a human issue that we all have a role to play in in fighting uh, and make sure that we move forward in a unified way and not necessarily imitate the divisiveness that identity political conversations have in America and elsewhere um, in, in the world. So yes, this would be what I have to say thus far. No, oh, thanks a million there, Eric. And I understand that um, I really like the idea that you're speaking for this unified approach. And it's really important that we do have that unified approach moving forward. And it's really nice to hear from that. India, do you have one, something to add to that? I'd just like to say I completely agree with Eric. I think that a united approach is definitely needed. When the Black Lives Matter campaign kind of blew up around the world, you began to you began to thought, you know, it's not just Black Lives Matters. It's not just Black lives that are affected. There are so many lives in Ireland. You know, there's, Ireland is such a diverse country, and it's not like people experience racism every day. And I just thought, wouldn't it be lovely if everybody could come together? 
and a united approach to show that there is so much racism in Ireland and that if we can support one group, we can support all groups together. I think that's really important. And I think that needs to be, you know, highlighted so much more now in a society, because as I said, we are such a diverse society and we need to start to be more accepted of all walks of life and all different cultures. Definitely. Thank you so much, um, India. And I understand that that unified approach can come can co- is, is going to be hard to get, come to and going to be hard to get there. But um, trying to get there, how can we get there? How can we have that sort of unity amongst group of different different cultures, different nationalities? I understand previously we, did, we spoke on this kind of idea of like groups being like, oh, but I need to get my voice heard. I need to get my voice heard. How can we actually get to that? I know, Eric, you have your hand up there. Just just to speak uh, briefly, because I spoke a few moments ago, you said it perfectly, Momobo, it is very hard to achieve. I actually think um, you know, we humans are biologically wired to favor in-group ways of thinking. You know, we want to think on behalf of our group. And when it comes to a group basis, an indivi- on an individual basis, sometimes we can be quite selfish. And it can be religious groups, it can be ethnic groups, national groups. You know, we see it with the rise of nationalism and the kind of racist rhetoric we hear from nationalists that are anti-immigration. You know, they're speaking to their own group and they're very exclusionary in their approach when it comes to other groups it's very hard to appeal to our common humanity and emphasize our commonalities when we have like negligible differences that are profitable for some people in acknowledging and i like to point to an example like a martin luther king you know in america and in the civil rights movement in the 60s you know he, unlike other black activists at that time, in that day, was saying that you know, white racist Americans that are brutalizing me as a black man are not only brutalizing me as a black man, they're brutalizing one of their brothers. They're not only hurting me as a separate entity to who they are, they, they are. they're hurt, hurting someone who's part of the human family like, like they are. And they're ignorant in that they don't realize it. But once they do, they realize how wrong what they're doing is. And it was that message that brought about laws that changed things for black people within America. That message that was harder to espouse in that environment of hatred, but one that brought about, brought about a lot of fruitful uh, outcomes. So I think once we realize the amount of change we can yield when we take that unified approach and get out of in-group thinking and realize the one ultimate group that we're all part of, the human family, I think you know, then you can convince people and show them how powerful uh, kind of a unified approach can be. Hmm. Definitely. And it's super important to have that sort of unified approach. I really like the example that you gave of Martin Luther King highlighting the fact that despite him being where he was at that time, the, the white races that were attacking people of color in, in the US, they were attacking a fellow American. They were attacking, okay, that's another in-group bias, but <laughs> they were attacking a fellow a hu- American, a fellow human being. So I really like the approach you were taking there. Tabby, you have your hand up and then I'm going to move to May. Um, yeah, I mean, just to, again, touch on what Eric just said, um, he said biologically, and yes, na- it is natural for people to want to cluster in groups with other people who have similar uh, you know, affiliations, but it's only when we step outside of ourselves and look and see, yes, that is natural. However, a more unified approach is probably what's more efficient, and that's what really we should go towards. So it's only if we can accept that it is a normal thing, you know, to feel that way, but to then realize that there is a bigger cause, essentially. Definitely. May, do you have something to add? Um, well, Eric was saying about um, that American who um, wants to think, like, who said that, um, that white people, white races were attacking him and they're attacking like another American, basically. I think um, when it comes to racial identity politics in the context of Ireland, the problem is, is that, like, people of colour have only really existed in Ireland for the last 100 years, maybe. So we're dealing with, like, a perpetual foreigner status here. So, like, it's, like, it's, it's blatantly obvious when somebody thinks that you're, like, not living in Ireland or that you're just a tourist or something. Like, one time, me and my sister went to the city and there was some man who just, like, said hello to us in Chinese and neither of us can speak Chinese because we we were born here, we've lived here our entire lives. So I just think that it's important to realise that... Um, so like as a person of colour in Ireland that you're always kind of seen as not Irish so that you have to kind of recognise that and that and so and once once you recognise that problem you can find the solution to it. Mm, Definitely I totally agree with that I've had a similar issue of somebody saying like how's the weather at home and I'm like 
I'm from Wexford. <laughs> so, so I'm like, <laughs> it's like, all right. And I think Ireland is going through a very transformative period in which a lot of people that are, I think this generation, particularly like the Gen Z generation of Ireland is the most diverse generation Ireland has ever seen. And it's important to have these kind of conversations moving forward, building that unity, educating the older generations, because um, because without that, it's just going to end up being very divisive. And he said, she said, my group, your group, he, his group, her group. So I really, really think in terms of understanding that, that, that this sort of multiculturalness that we have in Ireland is very new as well. Like May was saying, it's very new and we need to educate rather than reinforce that divisiveness and say that, oh, you hate me. Da, 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 da. Yes, there may be sort of hesitancy between groups, but um, having that growing that empathy and that commonality is going to be the best way forward. Um, Indy, did you have something to add there as well? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, I think we need to look at society as a whole in Ireland. As you mentioned, we're such, you know, we're going through such a crucial phase and the Gen Z are so multicultural, but we need to look at Ireland. You know, we look at the government, there's not many people from different cultures in the government. And then you look at, you know, TV and radio personality. We need to be more accepting. We need to be more diverse as a country in the huge media platforms. And I think that in doing that, it will start to open up more doors. I mean, Leo Varadkar being voted as Taoiseach was a huge, huge thing for Ireland. You know, he was from a different background. He was gay. And it just showed us as a country and it showed how diverse we were. And I think that we need more people that are diverse and from different backgrounds to really bring us all together as a multicultural society. Definitely. But like speaking on Leo Varadkar as well, like one of my questions would be like, just coming off of that, and I want you guys to think as well. One of my questions would be, would having people, and this is going back to identity politics and the general like danger of it, of, of it some as, as it is sometimes, but would having people of like different backgrounds, and obviously it's important to have people of different backgrounds and positions of power, but having them in that position of power only because of their sort of cultural background and cultural um, and diversity background and things like that. Is that a, is that an inherently good thing or, or a bad thing? I don't know. Does anyone want to kind of discuss that? Sandrine, you have your hand up there. Yeah. Um, oh no, that's a really good question. Cause I think it kind of goes to tokenism where you're literally like, are you picking this person to just tick a box, right? Because I feel like, let's say like in recent panels that have been happening, let's say even like with International Women's Day, they have like one black woman there and like they think that, yes, like we've answered the whole, like being inclusive. And it's like, you're not though, because it's how much power does that one person have? And like how much power, like, yes, it does kind of go back to like representation. So like, of course, if you see a person in color, you're like, I can be this person as well. But then you kind of have to understand that limitations of it and why they've kind of placed that person in place. It's because if you were to ever call them out of like not being diverse, not doing this, it'll be like, oh, but you're like, Momobo is like the president of this. Then it's like, it's a cop out for that. And I think that's where people really, really like need to be careful, like when we do say that. So like, do you know, recently it was, was it in Trinity where like they had announced like it'll be like the first female president and everyone was going crazy about that but then I was like realistically like when are you ever going to see a black woman in power in a, a university and it's like not in our lifetime so you see there like you can congratulate and be happy that okay women were moving up but then it's once you dissect that and once you understand that now universities when you do bring that up being like why can't I see women of color why can't I see trans women why can't they'll be like oh but like you know there's like three women presidents in Ireland so it's a cop out for that so like it's really really important to understand that and like when you do see those people in power like yes it's representative but then they are limited in that and then like it kind of brings about like a lot of pressure so like let's say with Leo Vadikar being a person of color and then like let's say even the fact that he's gay like there's that much pressure there being like you have to represent these two different groups and if you like you know if he does anything bad like those the, his identity there that's the first thing that's attacked and it's like you see this is what happens when you have this when you have that so like there is pressure there like where for us we can see it and it's like okay that we've seen that as a hope but then for the wider majority it is going to be if if they do mess up it'd be like an attack motive but then also being like 
okay, we've done our best that we can now. Let's go for another 100 years before we change that up. So, yeah, so that will be my issue with it. Like, it really falls into tokenism. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I totally agree with that term that it's it's always if somebody makes a mistake, it's always <clears throat> it's always the their identity market that is attacked first rather than maybe the mistake could be something totally aside from that. But it's it's the identity market that's attacked first. I'm going to move to May and then Blessing. Um, yeah, so it's basically like um, talking about having people of color or like other minorities in positions of power. And the problem is, is that when you have like that one person, like Leo Grantor, let's say, like, you're treating um, like all, all people of color as like a monolith, like if they all think the same and Leo Radker represents every single like person of color in Ireland, when really that's not true. And even though like um, people from multicultural backgrounds, uh, uh, even though we're a growing population, we are still a very small population. So chances are that like, if you're a person of color, you're probably the only person of color that like in your year or in your class or in your school and like everybody turns to you to represent your entire your entire background your entire like racial group or ethnic group and I think like that's the problem with looking like to looking to um like just putting a singular person of color on into the government or into panels or anything like that mm -hmm. and it's like I don't know I'm, I'm always like what's the word I'm always in between these kind of things like Sandrine and me were saying as well like when when you're you are added to these spaces or when you have are added to them like it's like okay talk about racism <laughs> it's like I'm more than I'm more than this you you want to represent your group and you want to do that as well but at the same time you want to um bring about other things and it goes back to this sort of like identity politics as well or identity markers more more than that but it goes back to that just as like Okay, why <laughs> why is it happening? But I'm going to move on to blessing. Yeah, when you guys were talking, I was literally having like major flashbacks in my head. Um, just cause while you guys were talking, I was just thinking that, you know, it's okay to have similar values with different opinions because um when you guys were talking about Leo Radka, it reminded me of you know, with the Black Lives Matter movement and, you know, especially when people are trying to get educated and learn from other people, they forget that like, you know, at the end of the day, we're all individuals and that like, you know, we all don't think the same way. Um, and I think that just kind of crosses with what you guys were talking about just cause, um, sorry, my mind went off track, just cause, um, you know, it puts pressure on when you have different opinions, but you're from the same community. It's kind of like, you know, are you speaking to represent what people hear or are you speaking to represent what you truly feel about a situation? So like, it's almost kind of like putting people up on like a pedestal of expecting too much from them when, you know, we shouldn't have to have like one person representing the one community and especially if someone does something wrong it's automatically like oh like you know all black people act the same or do this and that you know and I think that's where the danger kind of plays a little bit in it. Mm. Thanks thanks a million dear blessing and I totally agree with that like sometimes as well if you have if you are in like like an in-group and you have a different opinion to that in-group and it's not exactly the same as the out group there. You kind of feel isolated, no? And you kind of feel like, oh crap, <laughs> nobody agrees with me. So I'm just going to go to that agreeing, um, to the agreeing population that I'm in as well. So it's really, it's a really tough one. Um, I'm going to move on to Tabby. I was just thinking, you know, number one, going back to, you know, saying how you mentioned that your identity markers is what's attacked first. I mean, if we're really going to be honest with ourselves, how many of us have read something and kind of gone, please, Lord, do not let them be black. <laughs> you know, like it's just, if we're going to be 100% honest, it happens more often than it should. Um, but it's with having these kinds of conversations where like and I'm on my screen, I'm looking at three different types of black people. You know what I mean? It's, it's with having these kinds of conversations that we can, you know, get people involved who wouldn't, let's be honest, ordinarily think about these types of topics. Um, so that's how just, you know, even this is a contribution to the movement. 
definitely I totally agree with that Eric do you have something to add yeah, I, I just want to wholeheartedly agree with Tabby. I definitely think these conversations are essential in moving us forward when it comes to uh, issues that we're discussing here in this conversation. As for kind of leadership on kind of uh, political leaders like Leo Varadkar or even a Barack Obama, I think Barack Obama is a good example because his example has been played out. Um, you know, you, you definitely heard people say things like, you know, he's a black president in name only because he's not acting as he should be for the black community and things of this kind. Uh, and I think we definitely need to learn uh, from, from that blueprint here in Ireland as a society diversifies and more people inevitably get involved in politics from diverse communities. To know, as was mentioned already, that no community is a monolith. It's filled with many different people. So if one person is elected into a position of power just because they are of a particular racial group does not mean we should expect a certain type of rhetoric from them. We should expect them to hold one uh, type of political view. We should expect them to act in a in a particular way. I think identity politics in that sense can be quite trapping because if someone was in a position of power, you know, they feel obliged and mandated to do something just because they so happen to be uh, 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 belonging to a particular identity group that they didn't choose to be uh, a part of. They were born that way. So I think when we limit people to things that are out of their control, their race, their gender, other things that are that are related to them and their identity. I just think it's quite trapping and paternalistic, but instead we should allow people to be free to be individuals and to contribute as they see fit. Um, so I think this is the kind of liberating mentality we need to adopt. Uh, and again, respecting people's differences, respecting diversity, but also understanding that although we need to improve diversity, ideally we should want to get to a position here in Ireland where our society is so diverse and we respect diversity to the point that your little identitarian factors don't leave you out of the Irish group. Instead, you are part and we want to see you elected because you, we know you're going to do great things for our society despite your identity. But to get to this point, we need to appreciate diversity now and start making some changes in terms of the visual representation of Ireland. Mm, definitely, definitely. And I was just thinking there as you were speaking in terms of people in positions of power and things like that, I was just thinking getting into the like the political sphere and things like that. It's all this is my perception anyway. A lot of it is about just trying to get those votes as well and trying to get the people. And it's all it's a lot easier when you are getting into the people that look like you or have the same life experience as at you. So it's it's and then they may be disappointed when you finally get in power and then you have a different opinion so i just want to kind of unpack that as well i know india you may have something india you want to speak there but you may have something different but i just wanted to <laughs> say that there no i can completely agree with you mambo mambo and i can also agree with eric i mean identity can be so trapping and i hope that in 20 years time or 30 years time when we look at the government and we see people from different minorities and different backgrounds but we see them in politics because of what they've done and because of how hard they work and because of how great of a politician or a president or a Taoiseach they are, not because of their race, not because of where they've come from, because of the work that they've done. And I think it shows us as a, you know, as a society and how our perceptions can be very different of people and we can be so quick to judge someone on by how they look or what culture they're from and not actually how the person that they are. And I think that we need to change that as a society and become more, I wouldn't say accepting, I would say more diverse and more open to learning about different cultures and learning about different people without trapping people in boxes. Mm. If you get what I mean. <laughs> I totally get that. I totally get it. And um, I, I, I totally agree with that as well. And like you were saying, and Eric was saying that sometimes, it, and it is trapping for a lot of people, and it's just trying to break those barriers. And, and through conversations like this, that's how we're going to do it. Um, Garrett, did you want to add something there? Yeah, I, I was just going to say, like, the whole concept of identity politics for me is quite complicated. Like, within the queer community, there's so much internal kind of hatred towards each other, because especially, like, if you're white and queer, there's this expectation that you're able to hide that you're queer, so you probably should, because it'll get you further in life, it'll get you into positions of power. But what I'm kind of seeing regards identity politics and like going off that theme of kind of feeling trapped is a lot of queer people don't identify with being like in the LGBT community because it has all the stigma, all these stereotypes, and they feel that it doesn't represent them. So what I feel like 
when you think of like identity politics and these kind of markers so you think of like a gay man a trans man gay woman like they're all lumped together in this one community when it's so diverse in itself and it's such a complicated topic that it's starting to cause this hatred between each other and this conflict between each other because a lot of people like just don't either agree with it or they want to fit in with society mm. if you get me and it's it's so hard to deal with that because you feel because society has put you all in this one group you feel this one group should be united to um fight against whatever social issue oppression discrimination but like i feel the queer community just aren't able to do that now because there's so much people feel trapped in that box or they don't agree with that box and it's just for me it's hard to grasp identity politics when my own community still doesn't have their own understanding of what it means to be united yet. We have these kind of like small common issues like marriage equality, but then that, like that for me, that just turns into a form of like tokenism. Like when you bring up queer rights, uh, queer issues, like I uh, like just the other day, I was having this discussion with somebody about queer rights and they said, but sure, isn't like Ireland progressive because you've got marriage equality. And I must have made one hell of a face because I've never seen somebody backpedal on a comment so fast. But like, it's just, it's hard for me to understand like the concept of identity politics when my own community doesn't have that sense of identity. Like even myself, there's certain places or groups of people that I meet who are queer, but I just don't resonate with them. And that's okay. Not everyone has to resonate with each other, but I just wish within my own community that there was this kind of core kind of identity that we could all kind of latch onto and feel proud of. Cause I'm so sick of this like internal hatred that society has inflicted upon us. Like I see it on all the time. Like I know years ago, the drag queen Panty Bliss gave this amazing talk about passing how they walk down the street and like you check yourself as a queer person if you feel like if this might be an unsafe environment, you check yourself to see like, is there anything about me that's going to give me a way that's going to put me in harm's way? And like, that's such an awful thing to think about. And like, in terms of people in power, like, like you said, I'm conscious that anything Leo Varadkar does, and if he does anything that somebody disagrees with, the first thing that they're going to see is either a person of color or a gay man like that's the way that it's going to be and it regarding me as a gay man like if I like if I try to go for a position of power obviously and if they Leo Varadkar is that kind of person that they put me up against like that's going to be the common element that they connect so it's kind of it's a really complicated topic I think for the queer community to just there's so much internal hatred and I hate to see it but like and so for me, I feel like it's very much more individualistic for me now because even I can't, like I am a member of the LGBT community, but I just feel like there isn't a united LGBT community. So I don't think it's fair to lump us all into one yeah. um, kind of community anymore. It's just society has taught us that we all have to compete with each other. Yeah. So um, I don't know anymore kind of, but that's, Definitely. that's my rant over <laughs> <laughs> you're fine no some things that just struck me as you were speaking is, is this kind of like understanding that within communities that within communities that there is that diversive div diversity within minority communities if you get what I mean and it's okay to understand that diversity but a lot of times within those communities they feel like oh no we, we need to be like this we need to be like this and that's internalizing stereotypes of what that community should be and those stereotypes come from the majority communities so it's this understanding that we are different we share this experience but we are different in individuals we have our individuality as well so yeah eric do you have something to say about that and then i'm just going to move to sandrine and then may yeah, just two points. Uh, firstly, um, very well said. I think, Gareth, you, you spoke superbly. And if I'm interpreting, uh, I think the first component of what you said correctly, um, which definitely resonated with me, I think sometimes when, when there are groups within society, identitarian groups, racial groups, uh, sexual groups, um, you know, 
ethnic groups, national groups, we can create a caricature for that group. So if you're a member of that group and you don't meet the standards of that caricature, you no longer tick the necessary boxes that you need to tick to be you know, a part of the group. So you might have the characteristics that everyone in that group has, but if you don't do what you're supposed to do, suppose in quotation marks, you're not a part of that group. I think that can be so dangerous because it, it it neglects the diversity that exists within communities. You know, no community is a monolith. Um, and I think once, and I think at the root, at the core of this issue is the fact that sometimes when it comes to identity, when we place a, a lot of emphasis on a, a particular characteristic that one has to the point that it becomes a caricature in itself, people within that community who don't meet the standards of that caricature can feel alienated and isolated. It can because, be because of their religious views, their political views, or anything else. So I think you know, it, it, what we should aim to do and strive to do is to try and it, suck the kind of significance from these characteristics and see it as an integral part of us, but not a defining part of us. Instead, I would respect you as an individual, uh, instead of looking at you for the box you tick, for the group you fall into, and judging you on that basis, because you didn't choose to fall into that box. It's just a part of you. And secondly, I think something we need to be very aware of in Ireland, and I find it ironic that we spoke about Leo Varadkar a while ago, because I'm going to draw an example here from him. Uh, now, he put up a tweet um, last year, and it was in response to something a politician from the Sinn Féin party said. And he said, if you are white, male, or middle class, Sinn Féin doesn't want you, or something like this. It's something that politicians do, they go back and forth. So he kind of appealed to identity politics because he thought it would be profitable in a political battle against a different party. So once politicians partake in the game of identity politics, that might yield further division within our society and do more damage when it comes to us trying to pursue this unified approach. We saw it with Donald Trump. Donald Trump ap appealed to a kind of people within particular identity groups that were dealing with things like economic devastation. And he spoke to their vulnerability and their pain. And because the people disregarded those Trump voters because of their identity, it didn't give an opportunity to some people to convince them out of embracing such a terrible figure like Donald Trump. But he was there to appeal to their issues and bring them in with a form of identity politics. So I think we need to be wary of this in Ireland and ensure that we combat it, especially if it's coming from those in positions of power here in Ireland. Definitely, and I totally agree with that. One thing I would just say as well, like when I see people entering politics, it's like sometimes they do yield to that identity politics or give into that identity politics because it's just easier to get um, get a following, get people to have the votes. and. It's, it's having the people themselves understand that this is the person trying to yield to your something that you had no control of your identity and not not trying to actually get um obviously if it's an issue of like racism and other uh, things like that's it's needed but sometimes you just have to kind of look deeper and be like okay are they actually trying to get to the source of the issue or are they trying to just get me because i'm I take a box for them as a demographic, if you get what I mean. So that's just something I, I, I kind of wanted to unpack with this. But I'm going to move to Sandrine and then finally May. Yeah, um, I literally just wanted to talk about like with what Gareth had said about being in a certain community and then like your views are like not resonating with that. And yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. And I think like it's something that I've battled with ever like since being in Ireland. And I like, and I think for me, it's literally been like, being black growing up in Carlo and like being the only black person there and then like coming to college let's say like in Limerick and like seeing other black people and like just not resonating with them in that regards because you're so used to like being the only person and then like let's say like even last year like with BLM like I just found myself like not agreeing with every black person when it came to that like where I think for me it's like and I always rant to my mobile about that I just see gray area I just I just can't see black and white. And I just, it annoys me when people even like now, it's like black people can't be racist. I'm like, they are. I was like, I can give you A to Z examples of that. And I think then it's literally like, but like you're black, how can you kind of say that about like your own people in that regards? And it's like, we're different people. So like, I definitely agree with Gareth there where like there needs to be that link of individualism. And I think that's why for me, like, I'm always like, nope, I'm literally just, it's my view. Like it's Sandrine, like literally not like the black person. No, it's like just my name. 
because like I just think there's always that linking up to it because like if I was to like express that and say on Twitter be like oh you see like even the black people don't agree with each other it's like no no like that's just what I think because of x y and z like experience and I think like that's the sad part and definitely resonate there with Gareth like that's the sad part about being in that community and then feeling um, alienated because you're like can we not just see gray like why is it like why is this why is it so divisive like yes we have that shared experience of we all know what racism is because we felt it but again we felt it from different perspectives and it's different settings like I always explain it like you know like what I've experienced in Carlo is completely different from what I experienced in Limerick and things like that and then just to touch on with what you were saying in regards to the politics and that yielding I definitely think that and like if you can always see it like in like political campaigns where it is like let's say a person of color or different uh, gender anything like that it's always you know like I connect with you and we have gone through this and it's like no because perfect example is literally get out right do you know when like the racist dad was like I would have voted for Barack Obama a third time and it's literally though, like it's still that same thing, like where people are like, oh, do you know, like I vote, like I voted yes for like the referendum, but like I'm still going to be making homophobic jokes. I have BLM on my Twitter. Yeah, I'm still going to be making racist jokes. And it's literally because it's like, oh, I have a friend who's an activist. So do you know, like, do you know with those things where like they just group that all together and like they just get away with saying things like that. And I think then like when people are going into power and when you are going into politics or even stepping into that activism role, like you are aware of that and you should be aware, like if you are talking about like my lived experience, like it has to be me. And like, you can't say like, you know, like all us black people, like, you know what I mean? Cause it's so dangerous in that because when someone is going to be racist, they're going to be like, for sure, Sandrina Momovo say that. And I agree with what they said. So then there, so I think like, yeah, there was really like a need to look at individualism first. And then when someone is a, a, like politicians, like when they do use those we things like you do look into them to be like is it just a cop-out because people are going to use that and I just thought get out was the first thing that popped into my head with Barack Obama voting a third time yet we're gonna go and chop off black bodies like yeah grand <laughs> you know definitely and I think a lot of times because I, I study it as well but a lot of times um politicians and people in power they use that those words like we and us and our to kind of hack into that in-group belonging because one of the fundamental parts of human and it's on Maslow's hierarchy of need is this idea of belonging and if you belong to that person that is eventually going into power you feel like your needs are being met so it's really it's really important to understand that sometimes it may not be that and it may just be the person trying to get votes or on, on, on the contrary it may be the person trying to actually develop the 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 rights for your particular community or group but I'm, I'm going to move to May and then quickly India we're almost done all right yeah um I just want to touch on something that Gareth said earlier about like um communities having to compete with each other and we were talking at the start about like unity and, and approaching like politics from a unified with a, with a unified approach and I think to do that we have to stop playing like the oppression Olympics like people are always saying oh I'm more oppressed than you and because I'm this I'm more oppressed than you and I think that we always have to realize that like there's everybody probably has oppression to some extent and we have to like band together and fight against this together because the like, once we because like, it's kind of like a knock-on effect so like if you solve one problem like it's easier to find solutions for the other problems because you've already you've already experienced the first problem you already know how to solve it and um secondly another thing um I think Erica's saying something about um your identity being like an integral part of yourself not a defining part of yourself like I think that um, the end goal when it comes to identity politics is that like it won't be useful anymore, like it, like it won't be in use and like to kind of like get rid of it, to abolish it so that people can be seen for not like what they are, but rather who they are. Thank you. And India, do you want to add something? A final note? I just wanted to say that I completely agree with Sandrine. I mean, especially in politics, um, you look at different politicians and I was having a discussion actually about Mary Lee MacDonald as a as a minister and as a TD. And a lot of my views, people question them and they said, well, do you think this just because she's a woman? And I said, well, no, I see her as this and this and this because she's a great person in power, not because she's a woman. And I think we are so close, you know, we're so quick to say, 
oh, she's a woman, that's why she got elected, or he's a person of color, that's why he got elected. We need to stop that. We need to see he's not, he didn't get elected because he was a person of power. He got elected for what he's done and how hard he works and how hard she works. And we need to start, we need to start opening our minds to that and stop being so quick to put people into boxes. But no, I would completely agree with what everybody has said. Definitely. And on that note, thank you so much, guys. I really enjoyed this conversation. One thing that really struck me was what May said is like the future of identity politics, hopefully, is to not have it there. <laughs> Had to have this sort of sense that we have people for, what did you say? Is it who we are? Have them for who they are, not what they are. Yes, <laughs> exactly. And I think as we touched on previously is having this unified approach towards um people in positions of power and between communities as well because it's important to understand that each community has their own difficulties that they that they are facing and it's important to have that empathy between communities guys thank you so much for having this conversation again thank you for watching this episode of garden tv so what do you think about today's topic we'd love to hear your thoughts down below in the comments and make sure to like share and subscribe if you enjoyed this video we have new videos coming out every two weeks that dissect the social issues that affect Ireland's multicultural generation. And do follow us on social media to join the conversation and be up to date in what we're doing.